In this video, we're going to look at the notion of cardinality of a set and equinumerosity of two sets. So let's look at a definition first. So two sets A and B are said to be equinumerous, or in other words, they have the same cardinality if there is a bijective function F that goes from A to B. So recall that a bijective function is one that is one to one and onto, in other words, injective and surjective. And generally, we'll write the following notation. So we'll put these absolute value symbols around A equals B. Great. And then um, another kind of companion definition is this notion of countability. And we say that a set A is countable if it is either finite or it is equinumerous with the natural numbers. And sometimes we use the word countably infinite for this uh, condition of being equinumerous with the natural numbers. Okay, so now for the rest of the video, what I wanna do is provide just a bunch of examples. So maybe example number one will be that the integers is equinumerous with the natural numbers. In other words, the set of integers is countable. Okay, so let's like kind of sketch up a picture for how we think this should go. And then after we do that, we can maybe make a formula for the function that will construct this bijection. Okay, great. So let's maybe put the natural numbers in one row and the integers in another row. So we'll start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. So those will be our natural numbers. And now we're gonna list the integers right below. So maybe we'll start with uh, zero, and then negative one, and then one, and then negative two, and then two, negative three, and then three, and so on and so forth. So obviously we're gonna have a list of all of the integers on this second row. On the first row, we have a list of all of the natural numbers. And so this is gonna set up a bijective correspondence between the natural numbers and the integers. Now, if we wanted to explicitly write this as a function, which we can do in this case, but as we'll see later, we will not always be able to do, um, we can do that. So let's notice that all even natural numbers, so two, four, six, eight, so on and so forth, map to negative of half of their value. So notice two maps to negative one, so that's negative half of two, four maps to negative two, six maps to negative three, and eight would map to negative four. So that kind of gives us some motivation for this piecewise definition that we could build for our function f. So we'll say that f of n is equal to, so maybe we'll say negative n over two if n is even. And now we just have to figure out what happens if n is odd. So notice we have one gets mapped to zero, three gets mapped to one, five gets mapped to two. So this is a little bit trickier, but if you look at it carefully, notice that the output down here, in other words, the integer, which is mapped to by the natural number, is what you get if you take one away from the natural number and divide by two. So notice if we take one minus one, divide by two, we get zero. Three minus one, divide by two, we get one. 5 minus 1 divided by 2, we get 2. 7 minus 1 divided by 2, we get 3. So that's exactly what we'll put here. So we'll put n minus 1 over 2, and this is if n is odd. Good. So now, this, so now we've got a function, and notice the domain of the function is the natural numbers, and the codomain is the integers. And all we need to do is show that this is a bijective function. So maybe let's do that carefully. So let's say, so let's first show that it's injective. So let's go ahead and suppose that f of m equals f of n. But now what that tells you is that both of them have to have the same sign. So they're either both positive or both negative. Let's suppose that they're both um, positive. So if they're both positive, then their outputs are of this form. So we have m minus one over two equals n minus one over two, but then that very clearly tells us that m is equal to n. And then the other possibility is if the output here is negative, and if the output here is negative, we can use this. And so we have minus m over two equals minus n over two, but that also tells us that m equals n. So let's see what we started with. We started with f of m equals f of n, and we ended up with m equals n. 
And that's exactly what we need for this to be an injective function. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna erase this bottom part and then we'll prove that it's a surjection as well. So now let's go ahead and prove that this is a surjective function. And so that means that we want to take an integer and then find a pre-image for that integer. So in other words, what we're gonna do is let's suppose that we have m, which is an integer, and notice this is gonna split into two cases. So case number one will be m is less than zero, and case number two will be m is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, great. So now uh, notice if we have case number one, which is m is less than zero, then we can just notice that f evaluated at minus two m will be equal to minus minus 2m over 2, which is exactly equal to m. And this may seem like a cheat because here we've got minus 2m. Well, what if that's not a natural number? But we know that it is indeed a natural number because m started off as being negative. So minus 2m is positive. So that makes that a natural number. And now we're going to do a similar thing for the second case. Okay, so the second case will be pretty similar. So what we'll do is we'll take f and evaluate it at 2m plus 1. So notice if m is bigger than or equal to 0, then 2m plus 1 is bigger than or equal to 1. So that makes that a natural number. But now plugging that into our formula, notice we know that 2m plus 1 is an odd number. So we use this rule up here. So that's going to give us 2m plus 1 minus 1 over 2. In other words, that's equal to m. So for any integer that we can find m, we can find a pre-image. So if that integer is negative, the pre-image looks like minus 2m. And if that integer is non-negative, then that uh, pre-image looks like 2m plus 1. So now we've shown that f is injective and surjective. In other words, it is bijective. But if it's bijective, then that means that the integers are equinumerous with the natural numbers, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, I'll clean this up and then we'll do another example. For our next example, we'll look at equinumerosity between sets of real numbers. And in fact, what we wanna look at is finite intervals. So let's go ahead and suppose that A and B are real numbers. In other words, neither of them are like infinity or minus infinity. And what we're gonna show is that the open interval A to B is equinumerous with the whole real line. And we're gonna do this in two steps. So the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna show that any open interval is equinumerous with the open interval zero to one. And that makes any finite interval equinumerous to any other finite interval by some sort of transitive property, which we haven't proven, but that's not too hard to show. Okay, so we're gonna show that the open interval zero one is equinumerous with the open interval A, B. So we'll do this directly by constructing a bijective function from 0, 1 to a, b. So we'll call that function f again. So its domain is going to be 0, 1, and its range will be a, b. So we'll think about over here in the real line, we're starting with this interval 0 to 1. And what's happening is this interval 0 to 1 is being spread out to the interval a, to B. So we'll think that zero is being shifted to wherever A is, and then this length here, which is length one, is going to be spread out to this length here, which is length B minus A. So let's see if we can kind of draw that up here. So here, this point zero is being mapped to A, and then this length right here, which is length one, is being spread out to this length right here, which is B minus A. And that should give us some sort of motivation for how to write this function down. So we'll take f of x, and then we'll let this equal a plus b minus a times x. So notice this a at the beginning serves as to take this origin over here to this point a over here. And then this b minus a multiplier of x is just stretching this interval, which is length 1, to length b minus a. Okay, good. Now, the next thing that we can notice is that f of 0 is equal to a, which is exactly what we wanted it to be. And also, f of 1 is equal to b. 
Now let's also show that this is bijective. So we'll start off by showing that it's injective. In other words, it's one to one. So let's suppose that f of x equals f of y. So that means that a plus b minus a times x equals a plus b minus a times y. But then it's fairly easy to see just by algebraic manipulation that we'll get x equals y. And we can do that because we can divide by b minus a because b and a are not the same, which is something that we should have said up here. Otherwise, we would just have a point. And obviously, a point is just going to be a single element that will not be equinumerous with the real numbers. So the next thing that we want to do is show that this thing is surjective. In other words, we'll take some y, which is between a and b, and we want to construct a pre-image for this element y. And we can do that in the following way. So kind of in our scratch paper, what we're thinking about is solving f of x equals y for x. And so in this case, that is going to be a plus b minus a times x equals y. So we want to solve that for x. And so it's pretty easy to see that when we solve that for x, we're going to get x equals. So it's going to be y minus a over b minus a. So we have y minus a over b minus a. And what we'll notice is that because y is between a and b, y minus a over b minus a is between 0 and 1. So this is on the interval 0 to 1, which is good because that's where we, our domain is. And then furthermore, we can check that if we stick this thing into our original function f, we'll land back at y. And so let's reiterate what we've done here. So we've taken y from the interval a, b, and we've constructed a value x, which is between 0 and 1, that gets mapped onto that y, which is exactly what we need to do for this to be surjective. Okay, so what we've done is we've shown that any interval a, b is equinumerous with the unit interval 0 to 1, which tells us that all intervals of finite length are equinumerous with each other. Okay, so I'll clean this up and then we will work towards the second step. Okay, so now let's move on to step two. And for step two, we're going to show that the interval negative 1 to 1 is equinumerous with the real numbers. Great. And we're going to do that by constructing a function from the interval negative 1 to 1 onto the real numbers. And that function will be given by the following. So like I said, the domain will be negative 1 to 1. The range will be the real numbers. And we'll say here that f of x equals x over x squared minus 1. So maybe let's look at a picture of this function. So here, if we look at the only part that's important for us, which is between negative 1 and 1, we'll see that this function has the following picture. So now what we want to do is check that this thing is injective and surjective. And we're going to technically cheat a little bit in part of this proof because we're going to use some theorems that we prove later in the course, but you've used them earlier in a calculus course. So it's kind of okay. So we'll notice that this is an increasing function, and we can do that by noticing that f prime of x is bigger than or equal to zero, and this is true for all x between negative 1 and 1. So like I said, this means that f is an increasing function. Now we'll show that if f is increasing, then it is also injective. And we'll do that by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, suppose f is not injective. But that tells us that there exists x less than y such that f of x equals f of y. Well, really all that we need is x to be not equal to y, but since we know that we can order the real numbers, we might as well take x less than y. But we have f of x is equal to f of y, but then on the other hand, because f is increasing, we know f of x has got to be less than f of y. But that means we simultaneously have f of x equals f of y and f of x is less than f of y, which is a contradiction. So we have contradicted this statement that f is not injective, which tells us that f is injective. Good. 
So now I'll clean this up and we'll look at why f is surjective. Now we're gonna show that this function is surjective and we're gonna cheat again by using calculus a bit. So we wanna take an arbitrary real number y and then find a pre-image for y under this function f of x. So let's go ahead and take y, which is some real number. Great, and now we're gonna use two facts. And fact number one is that the limit as x approaches negative one from the left of f of x equals negative infinity. So that means that we can make f of x get as small as we want by going towards negative one. But what that tells us is there exists some x zero where f of x zero is less than y. And that doesn't matter how small y is, we can always find an x zero where f evaluated at x zero is smaller. So let's just say for instance, that y were right here, well we can get close enough to negative one so that we're below that point. Okay, good. And now we're gonna do the same thing with this other asymptote to the right. So in other words, we're gonna use this fact that the limit as x goes from the right to one of f of x equals positive infinity. But what that tells us is there exists an x1 such that f of x1 is bigger than y. Okay, so again, think about the extreme case, which is let's say y were really big like it was over here. Well, we can always make the output of f smaller by getting closer and closer and closer to that vertical asymptote. So now let's notice the following. So notice that we have f of x zero um, is less than y, which is less than f of x one. Great, but now what we wanna do is apply the intermediate value theorem and the intermediate value theorem, since this is a continuous function on the interval negative one to one, guarantees a number x that gets mapped to y. So in other words, by the intermediate value theorem, there exists some number x, which is between x zero and x one, such that f of x equals y. And that's exactly what we need for this thing to be surjective. So in other words, this function that we've defined right here is injective and surjective, so it's bijective. So this interval negative one to one is equinumerous with the real numbers. All right, I'll clean this up and we'll have some concluding remarks. Let's recall that the first step of this proof was to show that any open interval a, b is equinumerous with the open interval zero to one. And then the second step was that the interval negative one to one is equinumerous with R. And so now we can finish this off in the following way. So notice that the open interval A, B is equinumerous with the open interval zero, one. But then the open interval zero, one will be equinumerous with the open interval negative one to one. Again, just by using this first result where we've changed A with negative one and B with one, notice those are chosen to be arbitrary. But we showed earlier that that was equinumerous with the real numbers. Now we haven't carefully proven the transitivity of this equinumerosity. That's actually a good homework exercise. But notice if we look at the extreme left-hand side and the extreme right-hand side of this setup, we have that any open interval A, B is equinumerous with the real numbers. And that's a good place to stop.